practicing living truthfully every day in your real life and eventually it's just second nature for you. Hey everybody, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 462. Today, my guest is Miss Samantha Wynn. I'm Jeremy Lesniak, I'm your host here, I'm the founder at Whistlekick, and I'm just a guy, a guy who loves martial arts, all of them, and I'm training in as many as I can, and plan to continue that. Let's keep that white belt mindset going. If you want to see everything that we do at Whistlekick, go to whistlekick.com. You'll see links to various projects like Marshall Journal, links to our social media, and our store, because that's how we fund all of this stuff, from protective equipment and fun apparel to functional uniforms and more. Use the code PODCAST15. That helps us know that that purchase came as a result of this show. It justifies what we're doing to the accountants. You want to know more about the show? Go to whistlekickmarshallartsradio.com. Two episodes a week, all for you, all for free, and all to support the traditional martial arts community with education and connection and inspiration. That's why we do all this. Now, today's guest, you might have seen her on TV or maybe in movies. Maybe you follow her on social media. I will say she is one of the most authentic guests we've ever had on the show, and I had a wonderful time talking with her. So instead of trying to sum it up in any way other than that, Let's get into it. Welcome to Whistlecake Martial Arts Radio. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Hey, it's a pleasure to have you here. And listeners, I can tell you, just based on the the kind of pre-show chat that oh, it inevitably happens. I mean, it's very rare that we just jump right <laughs> into it. But based on on the last few minutes, I've I think we're going places with this one. I'm kind of excited. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am t- a little nervous, but oh. also oh. very excited. I, I like I like going deep. We'll see. Hey. Hey, we're, we're going we're gonna to make it happen. We're going to make it happen. And, you know, everything, because it's a martial arts show, so we've got to take the boring question that inevitably leads to some exciting answers, and let's get that out of the way so we can work off of that. It's a martial arts show. How did you get started with martial arts? Uh, I got started because I was forced into it. As the story goes, I, I think for many others, I, I continued of my own volition. But my mom was a black belt in Japanese jiu-jitsu growing up. So just by default, both my older brothers and myself had to join and had to at least complete our junior black belts before we were allowed to decide if we wanted to to quit or not. But I, I guess I didn't want to quit and I just kept going. And now it's my entire lifestyle. Ha-ha. Now, I, I've heard plenty of people say that, you know, their parents forced them to or, or you know, I'm tired of you getting beat up at school or whatever it is. You know, parents have a lot of reasons for putting their kids in martial arts. but most of those parents are not also martial artists. That is very true. So uh, you've got that that line of you have to achieve your junior black belt. Like that's that's not a small accomplishment. That's that's years. You know, I don't know how many how many years it was generally in, in your dojo, but mm-hmm. that's not a, a small standard to hold a child to. When, when, at what age did you start? Uh, I started at age four. Um, okay. But, you know, both my older brothers, they're two and four years older than me. So... I was always there, even when I was younger. I just, I don't remember not being there. And I was the toddler on the side of the mat that even though I wasn't allowed to join class, I was punching and kicking on the side, trying to follow along anyways. So I was really happy to go into it. But I think the reasoning that my mom put us through wasn't because she was worried about us getting beat up or picked on. But I think her goal was to instill that that work ethic and that sense of ritual, getting out our our energy, just all of the, I think, psychological benefits that you you end up um, accumulating along the way. And I found it extremely helpful for the way I am now in my work ethic and my, I think, ease in being alone at the same time, if that makes sense. But um, but yeah, I, I don't think it was for any physical reasons. She's just in my mind, kind of an enlightened person. And she doesn't carry herself that way. She's very unsuspecting. You'd think she's just this loving mom that's carefree and funny, but she is a very in tune woman. Mm-hmm. What, do you, what do you mean by in tune? I've got an idea, but let, let's, mm-hmm. let's go there. She, and I, I don't know how or who taught her these things growing up, but 
she's always been the, she, she's just had these little bits, these gold nuggets of wisdom that she's given to us along the way. Like, kill them with kindness, or you don't know what the other person's day looks like. Just general things when you're angry or upset or going through, you know, basic childhood emotions where you're in this whirlwind thinking and analyzing yourself. She just knew how to bring us back to peace so effortlessly, it seemed. And she wasn't a philosopher. She wasn't a psychologist. She wasn't anything like that. It's like she just understood these things internally. She would have me write down my goals and hang them off of my bed so that I, I could look at them every day and give me direction in life. And I don't, I don't know where she learned that. I think she just might have gotten it off of Google and known that it was really important for people and just given it back to us. But yeah, it seemed anytime she came across information or ideas, she just knew how to extract the most important aspects of it and, and give it to my brothers and I. And I'm, I'm so grateful for that. I can I can hear the the kindness and the it's 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 almost reverence. I mean, just it, it sounds like you're really appreciative of who she is and the way she raised you. I I really am, and again, it's unsuspecting for people. I don't think she she's not an egotistical person. She doesn't she doesn't really preach to anybody. She just she just is the way she is. But yeah, I, I'm I wouldn't be the person I am today without my mom. That's for sure. Mm. I, I think I think. We can all say that, you know, for good or for bad, Mm -hmm. hopefully much more for good. (laughs) You talked about siblings. You talked about your mother. What about your father? Did martial arts extend there? My dad is a day trader. He did do martial arts for a little bit. I think he saw the whole family going all the time and he wanted to be a part of it. And he did get up to his yellow belt. And then I think he just realized it wasn't his passion, his thing. And so he just continued to come and support us. But he, he never continued with the, um, the training himself, but he's an avid runner. So he's jogged or ran every day for the last 25 years. And I grew up in Barrie, Ontario, Canada. And I don't know if anyone listening has ever been there, but it is freezing in the winter. It would be negative 25, negative 30. And my dad would still go running. He would come home with icicles off of his mustache. (laughs) It was, it was ridiculous. So he had his own way of, I guess, uh, showing that, that work ethic and training and, and the will and that, um, yeah, we, we still learned very much the same lessons from him, but just through a different outlet. Mm. I just did a quick check on my phone and Barrie, Ontario is almost due West of, of where I am. Um, you guys would have had the lake effect, but temperature wise, I bet we're, we're pretty similar similar. doing the, the quick translation from Oh yeah. Celsius into Fahrenheit. I got, yeah. I got locked outside of the house one time after school <laughs> and it was a blizzard and I actually thought I was going to die. So that's how cold it is. <laughs> we had to, I had to build a snow fort with my, my two brothers and we spooned inside of it to get out of the wind and then never talked about it again. <laughs> that's great. I mean, yeah. all that time building snow forts for fun and then you got to use that skill to maybe save your lives or at least maybe a couple of toes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's funny when I tell it here, because now I live in California and that's just so far out of the realm of possibility here. But that was a very real issue then. When you started talking about martial arts, you said you were required to, I think the word you even used was forced, but at some point that transition, because you continued past that requirement of your junior black belt. Mm -hmm. Do you remember when, when it went from being a requirement to something you enjoyed? Um, It was actually when I decided that I wanted to be an actress and uh, something in my young brain just associated martial arts and the training and the mentality of that to what I needed for acting. And I kind of knew that at least in my heart, they kind of went hand in hand and the things that I was training in martial arts were helping me as an actress and the things that I wanted to be doing in acting would further my martial arts. And I, I just felt like they were a good complement, at least for my personality and my, my upbringing. But yep, that was around age 11 or 12. And mind you, I know that's extremely young for, for a junior black belt. And much of the training I did was just like conditioning. And like I literally got stuck in a toilet at some point when I was training. So 
take that no, no, no glossing over that one you can't, you can't well, drop that right away stuck in a toilet yeah i was i was really young i, I went to the the berry jiu-jitsu and you know you can only really absorb so much at that age i think most of it was the philosophies of, of the training that i that i took from it in the physical conditioning i can't remember very much of my jiu-jitsu training because i was so young but no yeah my i went to the bathroom one time and i was just so small i i i Lip, like I fell into the toilet as I was peeing and I got stuck and I had to yell for my mom from inside of the bathroom, which now I realize would have been horribly humiliating. But at the time I was like, I need help. And I was just screaming from inside of the bathroom. Oh gosh. I'm picturing it in my mind and it looks a lot worse than I remember it. <laughs> well, when you're that age, you don't quite have the the context of life to be, to be as embarrassed. I'm, I'm, exactly. I'm sure if we, dug into everybody's martial arts childhood for those of us that, that had it. There are some pretty ridiculous stories. I'll, I'll drop a quick one. I don't know that I've ever told this story, but uh, I, I started when I was four mm -hmm. and sometime age six, seven, in the middle of, of class, mm -hmm. I raised my hand to the, and, and tell the instructor, my mother washed my belt. And in our karate school, you know, you didn't wash your belt. Yeah. You washed your gi, you didn't, you didn't mm -hmm. wash your belt. And so the whole room turns and looks at my mother and my mother very confidently looks back at me and says, tell Sensei why. And I look at Sensei, because I dropped it in the toilet. <laughs> and the room's response was, they laughed at you. <laughs> I think it was a combination of laughter and we better move on before this devolves even more. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> That's really, I love your mom standing her ground like that. She's oh, that, like, that was something she was never afraid to do. Mm, you're going to embarrass me. I'm going to embarrass That's you, right. sweet. That's right. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like something my mom would say. <laughs> Tough love. Why acting? You, you knew pretty early. I mean, we've had quite a few martial arts actors on the show. Mm -hmm. And most of them, it's something that they end up in. Even the ones that, that have want, had wanted to do it for a while that aspiration doesn't seem like it took hold until their teenage years, but it sounds like it happened much earlier for you. Yeah. You know, I've thought about this because I, I, I don't fully understand why, but I think my guess is that I really love performing from a young age. I was always wanting to perform, whether it was singing or dancing or martial arts, whatever it was. But I think at heart, I'm also a very shy person and I'm very introspective and I can for instance, if I'm flying somewhere, I often don't bring music or headphones. I'll have a book, but I spend a lot of that time just thinking and reflecting and kind of checking in with myself. And I think I was so drawn to acting because it allows me both of those. I get to perform, but so much of the work, well, yes, yeah, so much of the work is thinking about feelings and all of those things that I love to do already anyways. So I, I don't know that I'm necessarily drawn to the glamour. Not that it's a glamorous thing because I, I'm literally rolling around on the floor most of the time <laughs> as my job. But um, yeah, it's a combination of performing and also getting to do my favorite thing, analyze my feelings like, like the typical actor or just like, I don't want to say woman. I think a lot of people analyze their feelings, but I, I, I can sit and do for a very, very long time. And it just allows me a platform that I can do that in a healthy way. And, and there are, there's an appreciation for that. It's not considered a bad thing. It's part of my job. Mm -hmm. That was a draw. How has that exploration changed, enhanced? I'm not quite sure what word I'm looking for there, but how has your acting affected your martial arts? It has allowed a level of response that I didn't have before I got really deep into my acting work. Um, I think just the concept of listening and responding applies to both, uh, as, you, as I knew beforehand, but it's like the more I was doing in my work and the more listening and responding and more, more in touch with myself and the, my scene partner, whoever I'm working with, I was, the more I was in tuned in martial arts to observing my partner or their movements, or I, I was just quicker at responding. And it wasn't necessarily that I was doing reflex training 
I just, I just saw more. And I don't know if there is a line where when I crossed over it into my acting world, it just became more apparent in martial arts, but it's that, that aspect of listening and responding that um, made all the difference. So I would, I would highly recommend acting training for the martial artist listening. If you know, when, when you're fighting or sparring and you feel like you just can't see the other person's movements quicker and you wonder how other people are able to react so quickly to dodge things so quickly or to anticipate the next movements. I was that person who wondered how other people's reflexes were so quick with that. But after acting, I, I see now it's almost like an instinctual thing that you develop to be able to really listen to other people. And to get out of your own head and your own ego of trying to be good at it and just doing it. In, in my experience, the word that, that I use is allowing. Mm-hmm. By, by getting out of your own way, by getting out of your own head, your feelings, you know, however you want to term that. I've had a few moments over the course of my training where I have no idea how this happened. It, it, um, there was an example a, a, a couple months ago, someone was tossing a pen to somebody nearby and I just snatched it out of the air. I had no idea how I did it. Mm -hmm. It just happened. Mm -hmm. And it was because I wasn't thinking about it. And I suspect that as you're getting better with your martial arts, you're getting better with your acting, which is making you better with your martial arts. And and Mm -hmm. it almost sounds like they're merging. Mm -hmm. Yeah, It, it does feel like it. And it wasn't even an intentional thing. I knew I liked performing. I knew I liked... Um, thinking and analyzing feelings. And I knew that they would, I think, go hand in hand, but I didn't realize that without necessarily training it, they would, they would, um, I guess, uh, help one another or, or help improve the other aspect so effortlessly. It just was an instinctual thing. It wasn't something that I, I was training towards. So that was a really neat discovery. So how did the acting happen? You wanted to act. Mm -hmm. And at some point you started acting, but what what did that that look like at the beginning? Uh, At the beginning, you know, it was just something I kind of did at home and my parents knew I wanted to, but, uh, you know, in Barrie, there weren't a lot of avenues to really pursue that. Uh, But my aunt found this convention and there are so many of them nowadays. I think it was Model and Talent Search Canada one of those things that you hear about on the radio and you're like, oh, that's probably just for them to make money or a scam or whatever, whatever it is. But I really wanted to do it. My aunt told my mom about it and I was, I was begging her and she has always been a supporter of whatever I wanted to, to do in life. And I think she knew because I love performing, maybe it would be a good fit. So she brought me, I had to do you know, monologues, um, read a commercial, the things that you do at those conventions and got my first agent, started doing print modeling and, and toy commercials. Uh, and then it just kind of went from there. But even at that age, my mom, because my mom was so such a big supporter, she would research and she and I both knew that, you know, if you want to do acting, eventually you move to LA. That's just the thing you do. But being a Canadian, it is a little bit trickier and we don't have family in the States. So we kind of knew that there would have to be something special or there'd be an extraordinary ability for the E1 green card. And, and that's when my focus shifted back towards martial arts because we knew it would, I I say we, because my mom was very much my, my partner in my career almost, but, but willingly, like I I wanted and, and needed her and I'm so grateful for it. She was truly, like an ambassador for me. But um, yeah, we knew that there had to be something special and I love martial arts and I loved action actors. And I just thought that would be the perfect blend of both of them. If I were so lucky to be able to do that in life, that would be amazing. So worked in the martial arts and just tried to, I guess, be so great at something that I couldn't be denied. And I didn't know what that would look like or where it would lead, but I knew if I worked my butt off, then doors would somehow open, hopefully, and I could step into it and be ready for any opportunities that came. But if I had to repeat the process now, I don't think I could do it. There were so many amazing people along the way and so many coincidences, it seemed, that 
I, I just feel grateful that things aligned the way they did. One of my favorite business podcasts ends each episode asking the guest, how much of your success do you attribute to skill and how much to luck? And I'm curious mm-hmm. how you would answer that. You're, you're acting this, this path. Mm-hmm. You just mentioned, you know, it almost sounds like if, if you were to roll the dice again, you don't think it would happen because of all of these external forces. Is, is that true? Um, that's very true. I don't know that I would call it luck, though. I do believe in luck. I do. But I, I think it would maybe be 50% skill and 50% connections of destiny, perhaps. Just amazing people along the way that you've allowed yourself to be open and vulnerable with, who, who in turn wanted to, to see you succeed because of their amazing hearts and and gave what they could give and in return i i want to give everything i have to give to people because i just feel so grateful for it but i I don't think it would necessarily be luck but but a helping hand from amazing people so 50 percent skill 50 percent all the wonderful people along the way sure and and i fully agree you Mm -hmm. know whenever i talk about whistlekick and what we've been able to accomplish it's Mm -hmm. it's far more than simply because I had this idea or this thing or whatever. And, and I think you expressed it in a really good way. You were open, you were vulnerable. You were willing to be so dedicated to that goal that you shared it at a really fundamental level with people around you. And that resonates. People like being around people who are passionate about things, even if they're not passionate about the same thing. Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, just being able to, to live and practice what I love uh, makes me just very happy and at peace person. I feel like I get to do the things that that give me peace, and so I have all this extra love and energy. I feel like, and I just want to give it all away. And um, I love meeting people. That's my favorite part of the job is getting to meet and work with new people and the same people on every job, and have all of these deep conversations and and get to hear so many different people's life stories and how they became who they are and what they're passionate about. And that's, that's my favorite thing to do. So mm-hmm. I, I think, you know, a lot of people crave that more than, more than we'd really know that those kinds of human connections and they're lasting, you know, when you connect with someone on that level, you can't really help, but, but want to see the best for them or you, you just want the best for them. That's why I, I find myself, whether even on a professional level, but a personal level as well, working with the same people over and over because you just, you end up loving them so much that you wouldn't have it any other way. And I really think that's where, where peace in life comes from. What was moving to LA like? Um, I've heard horror stories. Yeah. Yeah. I, I guess it was a little lonely to begin with. Um, I was very lucky that my, my ex-husband, I obviously knew him when I moved over here. So I did have someone, but I think it was harder for me to make like female friends than I had anticipated. And so for the first four or five years, I, I didn't have a lot of friends necessarily that I would go and hang out with. It would be a lot of training, a lot of, um, I don't know. I think I was still scared. Maybe I was 18 when I moved over here and it just took me a while to figure out how to connect with people or how to how to, um, yeah, I don't know what it was, but it, it did take me a few years to actually settle in and be able to appreciate the city for everything it has to offer. But there's still so much I have yet to do. Like I've never been to the Hollywood Bowl. I should probably do that. <laughs> I've never been to, to Disney World. I should probably, or Disneyland, is it Disneyland here. Um, I should probably do that. But um, there's no other place like it. When it comes to people, there are so many different types of people. And if you actually take the time to talk to some of them, it's actually really eye-opening and, and wonderful. And then also opportunities for this industry, of course. There's no place like it. Um, so for those reasons, I, I do love it. I miss Canada, though. I mean, it's my roots. But it, it was a hard transition. Mm, I, I'm, I'm sure. Now, when you said it was a few years before, you didn't say you made friends before you made female friends. And I'm, I'm wondering if there's more there. There's. Uh, I think just because of the, the industry I was in, which was stunts when I first come over here, 
there were just a lot more men around than women, I think. And because I grew up with older brothers, I think it was just easier for me to connect and speak on that wavelength. And it took me a while to step into my femininity. Mm. Actually, I think just recently in the last maybe one or two years, have I actually started to feel feminine? Anyone who knows me, any of my past friends know that I've always kind of said I felt masculine. And part of the reason I'm sure was all of the masculine influences in my life and um, all of the men I was always around, uh, especially on 300 Rise of an Empire. It was like 50 stunt men and me. And I literally like got farted on like my whole life <laughs> at work, my brothers. That, <laughs> that, just... that is the best example of what it's like to be a guy and be accepted as a guy that, that I've ever heard. Yeah. I just, I got farted on all the time. And you know, it's hard to feel like a woman when people are just farting on you and, and then laughing and no one even thinks twice about it. You're like, wow, they do not see me as a woman at all. So it's hard to see yourself like that. But yeah. I, I really value those times because I, I feel like I have a, maybe a good blend of both now, but it took me a while to find it. And and now I now I wear jewelry and skirts and, and I, I enjoy all of that stuff. But no, I, I didn't even wear jewelry before. I wore minimal makeup. I wore like athletic clothes all the time. I just I felt like one of the guys. And at the time I was I was proud of that and making those connections. But you know, I do think both are needed. And I'm 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 a better person for it though. Oh, I'm sure. We have a little bit of a, a recurring theme happening here as you get older, train, explore, you're integrating new parts of yourself. And so I'm going to ask that same question now from, from this point in the conversation, mm -hmm. how did that, how, the, how did discovering more of your femininity impact both your acting and your martial arts? Mm. I think I may be on that journey at the moment. Mm. So I'm, I'm not sure I would have an answer to that yet, but hmm. Yeah, I, I'm not sure other than being okay with, with, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know that I have an answer, but I'm going to be That's aware okay. of it as I carry myself through the world now. <laughs> yeah, but it's... actually, you know, it, from the acting standpoint, I probably can't answer. From the martial arts, I'm, I'm not sure yet. But from the acting standpoint, I do feel like my femininity is, um, well, I'm crying more. <laughs> I don't know if that's a good thing or not, but I'm feeling things so. on a on a deeper level, yeah. and I, I do think I'm. Yeah, they're they're resonating with me on on a deeper level, and I don't know why that is, but I like it. I like feeling it, and then taking the time to check in with myself and and try and discover why I'm feeling the way I'm feeling, or. Um, because, you know, isn't that the actor's favorite thing to do? <laughs> but um... One of my, my favorite people in the world, one of my mentors says that there's strength in vulnerability. Mm -hmm. And I think there's something to that. And it, it sounds like whether you've, you've been aware of it or not, that's something that you've had. I mean, that was, that was the word you used when you talked about mm -hmm. these people around you helping you to, to reach your goals. You were vulnerable. Yeah. Yeah, I guess so. You know, I, I think I've always been a pretty open person when it comes to my feelings. And I think it's given me a certain level of confidence because if someone asks me how I'm feeling or if I'm upset or what's making me upset, I usually have an answer and I've usually thought about it for hours and hours ahead of time. So it's not, it's not a surprise to me. Um, and I like that. Because it doesn't always have to be, or it doesn't have to be at all a negative thing. Feelings come and go, and there are reasons for it. But you don't always have to take it personally. You kind of can't control your feelings. Um, but you can be open and vulnerable about them and be open to them changing. And I think that alone means a lot to people because they can connect with you without feeling um, personally responsible. You can just be honest and let it go and see what happens next in life. But it's no one's fault or responsibility. Things just happen. Feelings happen. 
and you can try your best to navigate it and to to make other decisions or to change them but at the end of the day we all do our best and i kind of think that's it you just have to allow as you said earlier mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. totally let's mm-hmm. let's take a hard left mm-hmm. stories i love stories i love hearing our guest stories and i would imagine being on mm-hmm. set and and all the things that you've done beyond you know stepping in a toilet and getting farted on you've got some pretty good stories <laughs> so i'm wondering if you might you know share one of those behind the scenes moments with us i guess one of the memorable things that happened from my training years um i don't know why this one always stuck with me it was it's a little bit silly i guess but part of what our instructor had taught us especially as children was that if you can you always run first fighting should be your last resort you should try as many ways of resolving conflict as you can before you're you have to fight that's your last resort and so that always stuck with me and when we were doing our blue belt grading i must have been like i don't know nine or something um he would yell out technique number four and then you all the students would have to do it that was part of the grading So we all go up there. It's the first technique he's going to call out. We're all wondering which one. And he goes, blue belt technique number four. And then I ran out of the room. (laughs) Everybody else did the technique. And I don't know why in my brain, I just was like, well, the first thing you do is you run. (laughs) So I ran out of the whole building and nobody knew why I did that. And and they were confused. No one even laughed because they just wondered what happened. This child just like decided to sprint out of the building. And when I came back in, he was like, what, what happened? Did you have to go pee or like, where, where did you go? And I was like, well, you always run first. <laughs> then everyone burst out laughing. But and I, it's just funny, like the, the connections that your brain makes at that age. I don't know why. How, how old were you? How old were you though? Like, I think eight. Yeah. Around there. Anybody that's ever taught children is is probably laughing and nodding along because it, kids are amazing at coming up with breaking they break rules that you didn't even know needed to exist. Mm-hmm. Don't randomly run out of the, out of the building. <laughs> yeah. You stay you stay on the training floor while class is going on. Like no I love it. Oh, and great. you could totally justify it too like in my brain everyone else was wrong because he always taught us to run first. So if you're telling me to fight, I'm going to run first. (laughs) Apparently. I don't know. (laughs) I passed though. So that's good. (laughs) Are you still in touch with your instructor? Through Facebook. Yes. I I guess that's the beauty of Facebook. I haven't seen him in person in many, many years now. I would love to go visit, but um, all of my family moved away from Barry. So I guess it's just one of those sad things where I don't have a lot of um, reasons to pass through anymore. But it was such a big impact on my life that I I would like to go back. I just worry that my training would be so rusty I'd embarrass myself. (laughs) But I'm sure that's fine. I, I suspect that anyone who helped raise you and and you know you start training at at age four you're your instructor's helping to raise you. Mm-hmm. If you're able to take what they teach you and turn it into a career, I can't imagine anybody being upset with that. Even if maybe your your blocks, punches, kicks, et cetera, aren't uh, where they used to be. Mm. Well, thank you. I, I do hope that's the case. I know that they hold a very special place in my heart, so it, it's nice to think of that being the same. Mm-hmm. One of the things I enjoy about martial arts is that you know, it's it's not just physical. You know, it gives us these these tools, these resources that we can draw on through good times, difficult times, physical altercations, or just the stress of life. Mm-hmm. Think about a time where things were not going well, and you were able to use or reflect or implement whatever verb is appropriate your martial arts to help you get through it. Mm. Um. I guess that would be, I guess that would be the past maybe year and a half or so, um, along with all these 
amazing new opportunities that have been happening in my life. It was a very difficult personal year. I you know, went through divorce and that alone comes with a bunch of emotional turmoil. But I think the practice of, of um, being comfortable sitting with myself and thinking about my feelings and knowing that feelings come and feelings go and those things are temporary and there are other things that you can, there are ways that it can better you and, and deepen your understanding of the world. I think just knowing that that was the case already helped me get through it. it instead of just sitting and kind of um, indulging in your pain, knowing that that pain is making you stronger, just like in training, all the times you're suffering, you're so much stronger when you come out of it. Just knowing that and having experienced that on a physical level uh, gave me a lot more emotional strength that I, I wasn't expecting. So it, it was actually a really profound year for me for that. I, I found things in myself that I hoped would be there, but, but uh, they were. And I feel emotionally strong right now, which I'm really grateful for. But, but yeah, yeah. I, I think anyone who goes through, you know, divorce or death in the family or of a, of a good friend or any major emotional change in their life would would benefit from having a practice of either martial arts or an outlet of art something something to that enlightens them to the philosophy of of growing through your pain well said growing through your pain i like that if you could train with anybody <laughs> mm -hmm. anybody at all anywhere in the world anywhere in time who would that be um miyamoto musashi mm. definitely I'd have to go way back for that one, but uh, it's just so many of the philosophies he teaches. It, it's, I have this idea of who he might be if you'd ever met him in person, but I would like to know what that is for sure. Uh, as so many of what he, what he, um, talk, so much of what he talks about in the book is just such enlightened information. And it's so selfless and kind of removed from yourself that I just picture him as this evolved person who's super Zen, but I would like to know what that actually is in real life because I think a lot of times if you're just sitting with yourself, it can seem really chaotic, all the thoughts and feelings that go in and out of your, your conscious. And I wonder if you would be able to see that in him or if he would just be this Zen master or if he would just seem like a normal person talking about things like we are talking about now, only it's mm -hmm. recorded in a very eloquent way. And we see him as this, this um, profound philosopher. I, I, I'm just really interested to see how many of these enlightened people were just people. It sounds like your, the, the construction of him that you have, it, it sounds very similar to the way you talked about your mother. Mm. Yeah, yeah, actually. I think something about it gives me peace in knowing that you can have all of that information and be human. It's not like you have to be some special person to be able to understand these things and to be able to live them truthfully. I, I, I want to believe that any of us could be like that and any of us could have those, those, um, those guides and any, any of us could, could be that at peace with ourselves. Um, yeah. So I just want to, I want to feel like they're human, they're reachable. You know, it's not some far away godly person that can achieve that. Mm. Mm -hmm. mm. The people that I've met who, especially in, in the martial arts, we, we talk about this from time to time on the show. You kind of have these three tiers of martial artists. You've got the vast majority of us who, you know, we, we train, we love martial arts, we do our thing. And, and that's, that's where it ends. Mm -hmm. And then these two, quote unquote, higher, you know, I don't necessarily mean that word, but it's the easiest word to describe it. Tiers mm -hmm. of people. You have these amazing people who have done wonderful, wonderful things, you know, uh, Sensei Fumio Demura or, or Bill Superfoot Wallace, you know, people who are world renowned because of what they've done in and around the martial arts. And they are incredibly wonderful, humble people who are generous with their time. But then you've got that tier in the middle, people who think they have done amazing things. Mm. They really haven't. And they're not generous with their time. They're not humble. Mm -hmm. 
And it's really interesting when we reach out to guests, I can tell from really the first sentence that they write back, how the interview is going to go based on which of those three buckets they fit in. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting that you, you talk about Musashi and, and, you know, this idea that these grand philosophers really, they are people, they're not separate. And, and, and I, I don't know that I've ever thought of this before, but I don't think they can be separate and be as great as they are, because otherwise they're describing a condition that we're not going to relate to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so it's hard for my brain to, to come up with this human version of who they actually are. And that's why I'm so curious if we could sit down and have a conversation with them, how, how alike we would feel. And I would hope I'd be able to relate, but you know, it's, it's like you, you have this intimidating version in your mind. And I, I just, it's a, a curiosity, I guess, mm-hmm. to be able to have conversations and, like this and be able to learn more. I, I would just love that. Even from an acting standpoint, some of his philosophies, it's like, you know, just accepting everything the way it is. And just uh, his practice of how, how kind of little you need to to know and control and and think about it's just uh oh, it, it's it's interesting to me i think i i live so much in my own head because i'm always thinking about characters and feelings and everything that i would like to fully be able to just allow and i guess there are moments of that in my actual work but so much of the preparation is spent thinking about it that ah man you could you could definitely spin out <laughs> How do you prepare? How do you prepare for, I mean, the physical stuff, I I think we can all probably relate to, but there's so much more, there's depth to whatever you're doing, whether it's a stunt role or or something more, um, Mm -hmm. you know, more of a speaking role. How do you prepare for those? Um, I have a a wonderful theater teacher and she has a very simple phrase and it always resonates in my mind when I'm doing anything. That's effort is all. So I just try to do as much research as I can. I try to think about it as much as I can, watch material that relates to it, read, read books that relate to it. I just try to be as in tune as I can and try to feel, feel it as much as I can ahead of time. And then you do your best to just allow and to just let it go. And when you're actually performing or actually in a scene with someone, to forget all of that. And that's the hardest part. You know, some people struggle with the work ethic part of it, with the discipline to actually sit down and research and read and watch and think. And then those same people would find it, or sorry, the, the, on the flip side, the people that are really great at reading and, and doing all of the analytical work, it's really hard to let go afterwards because it's almost like you want to show your work or you want to be good or you want to whatever your ego reason is for it. Um, but it, it's hard because it's to ha- to achieve both of those. They almost work against each other. And I feel like you need the perfect blend of both of them to really do, do a, a great job. So yeah, I, I do my best to do both, but it's the allowing and letting go part that, that I would like to practice more because I spent my whole life with martial arts doing the work part of it. And I'm, I'm very comfortable with doing hard work. I want to earn anything that comes to me and I'm not afraid of working hard. But the allowing is something you can't just tell yourself to do. You have to feel it from the inside and, and allow. And it's so much harder than it, it sounds. You don't actually have to do anything. And I think that's the hardest part of it. <laughs> hmm. Yeah. Totally. And there's a... a fear part of it as well, because not doing anything means you have to let down all of your walls, any protection mechanisms you have. You really have to, um, you just have to live very courageously, I guess. And that's not something you can fake or put on. You almost have to evolve yourself as a person, I feel like, in order to do, to do a really great job. How do you develop that? I think it's, you know, I'd love to be able to ask one of the great actors, (laughs) 
uh, I do my best in understanding, but I would imagine it's just by practicing living truthfully every day in your real life. And eventually it's just second nature for you. Um, but that means exposing your flaws to the world constantly and being emotionally vulnerable constantly. And it's, um, I don't, it's a time. I'm on that journey. I think it's a lifelong journey. I don't know that anyone ever really gets there, but we can all do our best trying. But I think it's just being open and vulnerable and things that all sound very easy, but in practice, you don't know what you don't know. Mm, one of my favorite sayings. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do you have a favorite martial arts movie? They're, they're, Actors are the worst to ask this question. I'll, I'll be honest. Yeah, because there's none of you ever want to. None of you ever want to commit to an answer. I know. <laughs> <laughs> that was my my thought reading it, but I think if I just take one aspect of it. I really appreciate what the raid did for the industry part of it, because I personally am such a fan of that violent style of, of fighting on camera. And it's the most fun to be able to perform. I really like the raid for those reasons. I feel like it opened up this genre of real violent, long takes of fighting. And just as an actor or performer, it's so fun to be able to do that. I'm glad that it's becoming a little bit more mainstream and you get to experience that because there's nothing like it on set when you get to do a whole sequence and you get to live it fully all the way through you know maybe 20 kills or something as opposed to punch punch cut punch kick punch cut slash slash cut it's uh yeah it's like it's in wushu i would i would do a minute and 30 second routines. So I, I like being able to do the whole thing and getting that adrenaline rush and you, you really feel it in your bones. So I, I like that because of the raid. It's now I can common. hear you getting pumped up as you're talking about it. Yeah. I'm like moving my arms around. I'm out of breath. <laughs> <laughs> I just really like it. On my last project, I got to do a couple really long takes of, of things like that. And there's just nothing that compares to it. And especially because you need more people for longer takes too. Mm. And with the more people who are just as involved as you are, there's an energy that just can't be replicated when you get to live through the whole thing like that. It was like a performance on a stage for every single shot. You just get to reset and do it again. And then any, any extras or crew members, they're getting like a show. And I love that because I'm a performer. I love giving people a show and it's a great feeling. Nice. Tell us about your last project. Um, it is called Army of the Dead, a Zack Snyder film on Netflix to be released winter 2020. Um, but it is going to be a zombie flick. So I'm pretty excited about that. And oh. I'm pretty excited that there were there was a lot of weaponry in it, um, like gun handling that we got to do training for. Um, and not a whole lot has been released about, about story or details yet. So can't talk too much about it, but the kind of training that we got to do was something new for myself. Um, we had a couple SEALs going over um, like rifle and pistol work with us and, you know, anything involving zombies is just going to be um, super fun. But probably yeah. one of my favorite experiences on that was in one of the sequences, um, Oh, let me see. I don't know how much I'm allowed to talk about yet, That's but right. it was nice discovering some UFC fighters that were there. And I had no idea that they were there, but zombies is just such a, a genre that is fun for people that why wouldn't you be there if you could be there? So it was, it was really neat to meet. Like, um, yeah, yeah. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> I hate how vague I have to be. I just, I, I, <laughs> We, we've had we've had episodes that were embargoed to certain times. It's I, I understand, and I, I think for the most part, the audience the audience gets it. So, bottom line, there's a movie on Netflix coming out now. When you say winter 2020, does that mean like January or December of 2020? I think it probably means December. Eric. So we have a year. We have to wait a year for this. I know. That's I have to wait a year too. It sucks. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have anything lined up? What's next? Um, I have a couple personal projects that I've been 
working on a little bit more lately. So I've, I've kind of been dabbling in, you know, writing and producing my own smaller projects and just experimenting with that at the moment. So if they really suck, I may never release them because, <laughs> because the of film, right? Uh, what's that? It's the beauty of film. If, if it's, if it's a bad take, nobody has to know about it. Exactly. So we shall see, but I, I'm really appreciating the journey on that, but, um, uh, yeah, there's a, a short film I'm, I'm working on by myself at the moment that I feel very emotionally connected to. So that's taking my immediate time. Um, can you tell us anything about it? I, you can do a little bit. <laughs> I'm such a private person with this stuff. It's funny for being such a, in such a public industry. I like hold so many things close to myself and I'm like, back away. It's my heart. <laughs> <laughs> but oh. um, I, I guess it's, it ended up being more of a parallel and more of a reflection of what was going on in my personal life than I anticipated. Mm. So it's making me really nervous as I'm going through it. But I have a, a wonderful group of friends and collaborators, uh, both, because a lot of the collaborators I work with are, are so dear to me, um, that have been on this journey with me, which is um, the most special part of all of it. But it's, it's just a very simple story, two people, a lot of open space, and a lot of things emotionally and mentally that happen given those circumstances. So, yeah, very cathartic. Is that, is that a fair word? Yes, I would say that. Okay. Well, I, I we can we can uh, apply our own suspicions and and hopefully when I don't even want to say if, but when mm -hmm. you're willing to share that with the world, that that we can all get to check it out. Yeah, very appreciated. <laughs> so let's talk about the future. Let's talk about mm -hmm. goals and training and work and, and, and anything else. When you look out into the future, as far as you want to look, I mean, you can look next week, you can look next year, look out to, you know, be a hundred if you want. Mm -hmm. What, what's coming? What are you hoping for? What are you working towards? What, what are your goals, your aspirations and, and anything else that might fall into that bucket? You know, there's only one line that comes up in my head and that's, I want to help people. That's always something I strive to do. And I think I'm in this place now where I'm figuring out the best way for me personally to be able to do that. Um, so I'm not really sure, but I know I'm doing this all for something. It's not for accolades or for money or anything like that. I, I want to be able to use this to help in some way. Um, and I've always, I don't know why, you know, there are certain things that hit you harder than other things, but for me, like human trafficking has always been one of those things. The moment I discovered what it was and, and the effects it has on, on the victims, I just, I don't know, but I know I want to be involved in that healing somehow. Um, I, there were a couple of times in my life where I was being followed and and when I went down the rabbit hole of what that could have been or why I was being followed or what could have happened, it just freaked me out. And, and from there, I couldn't really go back. And I knew I wanted to, to help somehow. So that is somewhere in the very distant future. But along the way, um, I think I want to live this to, and see, see how, how big of a, see how much of a platform or how much how much I could really grow now in order to be able to affect change for that later. But I really have to focus on one thing at a time because there's, I can't put the cart before the horse. Sure. sure. Yeah. yeah. And if people want to find you online, stay in touch, you know, see what projects you've got going on and, mm -hmm. and all that, how would they do that? Um, my Facebook page uh, at official Samantha Wynn or my Instagram, but I'm a little bit sillier on my Instagram. So to get a better reflection of who I am as a person, I guess Instagram would be the deal. And that's sam.antha.win. Um, yeah, uh, I, I struggle a little with social media. I know some people are like so effortlessly great at keeping people updated, but 
But again, I just feel like such a private person most of the time. And if I do show things, I show the weirdest parts of myself. (laughs) I do. If you were to look at my online presence, you'd be like, this girl has nothing in her head and she's just weird. She wears sumo costumes at Halloween, dances and takes weird pictures. But I I don't know, maybe that's a protection mechanism or maybe that's just me trying to practice taking myself lightly and taking the world in deeply. Another Musashi philosophy. (laughs) Or maybe that's just another very real part of you and that's the avenue you feel comfortable expressing it. Yeah. You're not going to get any criticism about silliness from me. Anybody that knows me, longtime listeners know I'm, I'm a pretty goofy guy. Yeah. That is very appreciated. I'm a really goofy person too. And I think it'd be hard since we have conversations like this, I can seem pretty in my head about things or, I mean, I do think about feelings and and analyze things a lot, but I'm equal parts, a total weirdo. So (laughs) yeah, I guess it's the duality of people. We're all, we're all different. We're all a little bit weird. I hope so. (laughs) All right. This has been awesome. Tons of fun. I thank you so much for your time. And I'm going to ask you to send us out, you know, give us some, some parting words, some whatever you want it to be as we head into the the closing that I'm going to record later. I guess live bravely, love deeply, feel openly and give generously. I can usually tell within the first couple minutes of conversation with a guest before we even start formally recording how the episode's going to go. And this time it took about 30 seconds. I knew we had something good from moment one. And I was really, really happy that I wasn't wrong. I had a great time talking with Miss Wynn, and I hope you had a good time listening. If you haven't already, go follow her on social media, see all these things she's got going on, and make sure you show her movies and upcoming projects some support. If you want to learn more about her, pop on over to the website, whistlekickmarshartsradio.com. Find the episode, episode 462, and there you'll find photos and links and a whole bunch more. Sign up for the newsletter while you're there, and then maybe when you're done, go to whistlekick.com. Show us some love. Make a purchase in the store, or leave a review, or share something. Lots of opportunities to show some support for the things we've got going on. If you want to email me, Jeremy at whistlekick.com. If you know of a great guest we should have on the show, send us the guest form. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. Whistle, kick, march, 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 march,